Okay, folks, we're back. We're moving on. This is uh, lesson 13, cooperation. You have failed many times. How fortunate you ought to know by now some of the things not to do. We've talked about this before. Failure is not an option. Of course, it's not an option because you will fail. And the higher you want to fly, the further you want to go, the more you want to do, the more you're going to fail. Okay, And that's a given. Failure is not an option. That's true because you're going to fail. Fail in droves. The best way to learn is to fail. Uh, learning is all about failing. Not knowing, doing some research and understanding more, making some attempts, failing, come back, coming back. After learning some new insights, some new angles, some new background, whatever it may be, and then you're filling in the gaps, which caused failure, right? No matter what you're doing, you're an athlete, you're a CEO, you're an accountant, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're an engineer, it all begins with failing, failing, right? Uh, no matter what you do. So failing is not an option. It's probably one of the most uh, benefactory or beneficial um, aspects of achievement. Um, sadly, maybe it gets... Um, it's a negative connotation, especially in schools and our classrooms, you know, kids not knowing, raising their hands. Uh, that, of course, some of that is just relative uh, immaturity. It's the state of the nation or state of the being of the individual at the time who was very young and immature. Okay. So, uh, but if that continues on into an adult, adulthood, that becomes highly problematic. The most well-adjusted individuals are the ones that understand their limitations. We are all equal in our infinite ignorance. What you don't know is monumental. What you do know is a very minuscule, minute subset of a particular knowledge base, database, uh, field, or section, subsection of a field, a niche, if you will, niche. All right. <clears throat> Cooperation is the beginning of all organized effort. As we stated in the second lesson of this course, Andrew Carnegie accumulated a gigantic, gigantic for fortune through the cooperative efforts of a small group of men numbering not more than a score. You too can learn how to use this principle. There are two forms of cooperation uh, to which your attention will be directed to in this lesson, namely first cooperation between people who group themselves together and form alliances for the purpose of attaining we're giving end under the principles known as the law of mastermind, which we talked about in the first chapter, the first lesson. Second is cooperation between the conscience and the subconscious minds, which forms a reasonable hypothesis of man's humans, the ability of humans to contact, communicate with and draw upon infinite intelligence. Infinite intelligence, that could be the mind of God, that could be the outer self, that could be uh, the intuition, the deeper self. I don't know where it's located or where you want to locate it or its locale, right? Um, Einstein talked about intuition, gut instinct. You know, some business people talk about gut instinct, intuition, infinite intelligence. Right? And that's something that I just spoke to, right? Um, We're all equal in our infinite, there it is, ignorance, right? But you're constantly building. I mean, even if you sat around and read all day, every day, like maybe a Thomas Jefferson, you know, there were times when he was reading 12, 10, 12, 15 hours a day. They must get a sore butt after a while. Uh, but but um, even if you did that, you would still, your whole life, you know, say you lived to be 95 and you did that every day for your whole life, uh, you would still... No, just a small, infinitesimally small uh, subset of all the now of all knowledge that exists. Here's a case in point: if you live next to a large library, I knew I live next to UCLA, so I could go down to one of their very large libraries or maybe a public library. There's one at CSUN Northridge, also nearby. Huge millions of volumes of works. If you ever feel empowered you feel like you're a mr or mrs know-it-all go down to that library stand right in the middle middle floor of the middle 
of the library, right? And begin regurgitating on Q all the knowledge in all the books, A through Z. Go, go, begin, right? Most of us wouldn't get very far, right? You should say all of us, right? Even if you have a photographic memory, you're still not going to know all that you don't have the time. We don't have the time or the resources, capacity, or, or reason oftentimes to acquire all that knowledge. So you can only know something. This is why Einstein said, intuition is everything. He says, at some point, you, you can only study, read the books, go to the library, take out books, read, study, research, uh, even experience, you know, engage in some way, shape or form the mind. Uh, and it might be through the tangible uh, experience as well, right? Uh, you, you can only do that so much. At some point, you have to kind of just go with your gut instinct, go with intuition, right? That type of thing. So that's what Einstein was talking about. Intuition is everything, right? Because of our limitations. So Einstein, like many great thinkers, very aware of one's limitations, right? That's another thing. And I talk about that with Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about, do you believe in UFOs? And he, one of the first things he did after he defined UFO, and then we talked about definitions, you know, almost always when you're making inquiries about something, you almost always have to start with definitions. What is a UFO? Unidentified flying object. I, you know, define what UFO is. Um, if you want to know what you're doing in life, define you first and foremost, right? Define your limitations, define your, define your strengths, your weaknesses, your basic characteristics, innate tendencies, right? Natural leanings, inclinations, blah, 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 all that good stuff, right? So definition, definition is huge, right? But after definition, uh, what did Neil you know, deGrasse Tyson and Einstein and others, great minds, uh, what do they do? Where do they go, right? Um, they they begin uh, looking into, um, you know, the intuitive or starting to understand or to infer through the intuitive <clears throat> because of the limitations of the mind. And that's that's where you usually go, you know, limitations, you know, I do, I've defined things, but also I have limitations. Just like in critical thinking. Critical thinking is one of the things that you do. At first thing is to analyze. And then the second thing to do is synthesize. You're going to synthesize your knowledge, experience, understanding uh, with whatever it is that you have to research, right? Um, analyze, synthesize, and then make a judgment, right? Infer, analyze, deduce, judge, make a judgment, right? judgment call and oftentimes <clears throat> that judgment call or the answer solution usually will entail to a certain degree depending on the complexity of whatever it is that you're looking into solving to a certain degree it'll, it'll include just intuition got instinct feel right uh, <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> the one who has not given serious thought to the subject the foregoing hypothesis may seem unreasonable but follow the evidence of its soundness and study the facts upon which the hypothesis is based. Draw your own conclusions. Let us begin with a brief review of the physical construction of the body. And you can do that too. You can go through that. I'm not going to go through that in extensive, exhaustive detail, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look. I'm still talking about the body. Cooperative system. There's the break. Uh, we will now take up the subject of cooperation between one human or human between men who unite or group themselves together uh, for the purpose of attaining a given end. In the second lesson of this course, we refer to this sort of cooperation as organized effort. This course touches some phase of cooperation in practically every lesson. This result was uh, inevitable for the reason that the object of the course is to help the Student develop power, and power is developed only through organized effort, right? And power comes through, you know, being pretty thorough in your plan and your approach, right? Feels a lot better to get a 95 and then to get a 60, 50, 40, 30, right? If you're not organized enough in your approach, you're not going to achieve or exceed, never mind meet, expectations, right? 
We are living in an age of cooperative effort. Remember now, this is 1928. But things are, that's true today, true. Nearly all successful uh, businesses are conducted under some form of cooperation, true. The same is true, especially the larger it is, the more that is necessary, right? Same is true in the field of industry and finance, as well as in the professional field. Doctors and lawyers have alliances for mutual aid and protection, so they have these groups, these associations, bankers, retail merchants, automobile owners, printers, well, all this stuff. The laboring men have their unions and those who supply the working capital and super superintend the efforts of laboring men have their alliances under various names. Nations have their cooperative alliances, right, so forth. It is slow, slowly becoming second a uh, full paragraph there, becoming obvious to man, humans, that those who most efficiently, effect, efficiently apply the principle of proper effort survive longest. Um, and this is why, and some of you may not agree with this, but it doesn't matter. The facts are out there. This is not, most of what I give you is not opinion. I right? pretty much in sound fact and research, evidence that has been gathered again, again, time after time. Uh, over and again, right? That uh, those who are married uh, usually are live the longest, most healthiest lives, lives, right? Um, they're usually uh, employed more frequently, more often. Um, just how it is, you know. And what's what's the um, uh, what is what is the statement about um, being successful? Let's see, um, graduate from high school, um, be married, and what was the other one? There was like three things. Graduate from high school, get married. Oh, it's, it's escaping me now. And this, this is the big three that has been brought up time and time again. I can't remember the other one. Graduate from high school, or well, stay in school, graduate. Right, uh, get married and something else. I, I forgot what it was. Right, Let's see if I can find it. Talk amongst yourselves. We've been here before. Just a second. See if I can find it quickly. Yeah, it doesn't say. But anyways, I, I figured what it was. But it's it's something along those lines um, about you know there are there are certain things that you do. Excuse me, in order to survive, survive well. One of the things is study, do your research, understand yourself, have a plan, have people around you who will support you. Um, you know all all the things that we've been talking about in these lessons, right? And it's a lot better to to know things and to plan things out, understand limitations, work on strengths, limit weaknesses, and all that good stuff, right? Rather than just mindlessly walking through life and hoping for the best, right? So planning, effort, some level of action, some say massive action, maybe at the beginning, and I've been there before doing massive action, you know? Um you know, it's it's the, the best way to not only um, survive, but thrive and to find satisfaction, right? You're going to have your up and downs and difficulties and challenge, that goes without saying, but you have a much better chance. It's statistically proven, right? That's why a lot of these um, concepts or theories, excuse, excuse me, concepts or theories or works uh, such as this one, Thick face, black heart, as a man thinketh, and so forth. That's why these things are studied, you know, so people can maximize their potential, make fewer mistakes, uh, be more leery and aware of, uh, you know, what's out there, uh, what's coming, right? Um, and this is why I, I teach about education. What is your education? What is it? You know, school, 
at least high school, secondary. What is it? What is it giving you? What is it not giving you? What do you need? What do you know about what you've gotten? Is it totally useless? Is it just something, a piece of paper that helps you take the next next step towards getting work? I don't know. Does a high school diploma mean, what does it mean? You know, I'm sure there's a general definition. There's a general meaning. There are general um, skills and knowledge, maybe attitudes that you can learn through attending school. What are they? Do they know? Do you know? And more importantly, do you know what you need? And is school, college, whatever you're being exposed to, you know, uh, parents and friends and books and courses and, uh, you know, experiences and, experiences and so forth. What's, what's it all giving you? What, what are you needing? I know, I know pretty much know what people need, but I spent, you know, years and years researching and I went first 27, 28 years of my life just kind of floating around in semi-confusion and misery. I told you some time ago I had suicidal tendencies. I was often walking around just depressed and lost and, you know, feeling nothing, really. So what does it all mean, you know? I'm going to um, maybe have, you know, do some, go out and get a job, work for a while, <clears throat> to have family and, family and friends, do some occasional activities, hang out, have some distractions, entertainment, maybe buy a house, get a family, uh, 40, 50 years of that, retire, and then die. So what? And then eternity of nothing. What's the average uh, life expect expectancy now in the United States? 85, mid 80s, hell, you could live to 160. Not much difference considering eternity gone, right? That may seem kind of morbid. Maybe I don't want to think about it. Maybe I don't want to talk about it. But now you're putting things in proper perspective. I think it was Stephen, uh, Stephen um, not Stephen Hawking, Stephen Jobs who said, you're already dead. Why are you doing, meaning life is very short. He died. He was quite young in his early 50s, right? And now it's over. Etern eternal expansion of time. Millions, billions, trillions, endless years of not here. Wherever, where, whatever you think happens after, it doesn't matter. We're here now, so we'll take care of here, the here and now, here and now, right? Maximize it, right? So that when you are exiting, you don't sit there and go, well, that really sucked and I'd like a do-over. I'm really depressed. Because <laughs> apparently if you do it the right way, most people uh, don't don't really mind moving on, as they say, you know. Uh, and, is, and is often said by many a wise person, they say, wise people say, you know, um, it's not so much what, what you have done, but what you haven't done, right? Those are the regrets. And I doubt in your final days will you be laying there going, oh, if I had only partied more, hung out at Disneyland more, made more money, bought more stuff, owned more stuff, impressed more people with my power and political influence, yeah, just need a little bit more of that, right? What do you take with you, with you when you go? Probably just thoughts, right? So what type of thoughts are golden thoughts? The most valuable stuff is the gold, the silver, the um, platinum. Why is it valuable? It's rare. It's rare. And it's also probably got some some strength and unusual merit, right, uh, to it, right? It's made up of substance that has value because it's rare, and it's it's usually strong, lasting, of st considerable strength, right? Um, so what are those things that are strong and lasting and then of considerable strength that will lift you up and enhance your life? I can tell you. I know what they are right? But you have to 
figure out what they are. I'm trying to give you some help, helpful hints, tidbits and things as such, right? Uh, but, you know, ultimately you have to figure out for, for yourself, right? I can only prompt and guide and nudge you along, right? You're really going to have to take the horse by the reins and get a ride, right? Um, where was it? Slowly becoming obvious to people that those who most efficiently apply the principle of cooperation, cooperative efforts survive longest and that this principle applies from the lowest form. I think survive longest uh, physically in regards to life, but also career. And I've been around for a while. You know, you can see by the, the hairs here, right? This is my helmet of recognition. Long time recognition on the planet. Long time on the planet recognition. My helmet of recognition, my, my gray hair, right? And I've seen the people who are most successful are usually cooperative. They're doing certain things. And they're having a pretty good life, right? So don't do stuff that negates your life or anybody, else, anybody else's life, right? So now we go, let's just skip to this, but well, Carnegie and Rockefeller, Ford have taught the business man, person. <clears throat> well, actually back at the time, it was businessman. The value of cooperative effort, that is, they have taught all who care to observe the principle through which they accumulated vast fortunes. And it's okay accumulating money. I don't know about vast fortunes. Total number of millionaires in the, uh, in the world right now is about it's less than 1%. So 99.9, oh, less than what's that? We'll say 99.5%, right? It's 4%, 3%, right? Um, we'll become wealthy, you know, millionaire or more, right? So I wouldn't really worry about that. And, and you, you can work to achieve it. No problem with that, right? If, that, if that's your thing. But first and foremost, as Einstein said, you have to become a person of value. Don't become a person of success. What does that mean? That's like, I want a degree. No, you don't. You don't want a college degree. You want something that will afford you the opportunity to, to do what you want to do in life, which is maybe make money, make your mark, have something of value to offer to family, friends, and coworkers, and so forth, right? This is the stuff you have to think through. Start putting that stuff in your head, you know. Uh, see, as, I, as I do that, I, I will now drink a kombucha. All right. Um, Henry Ford's most tangible asset is or was the well-organized agency force that he has established. This organization not only provides him with an outlet for all, all the automobiles he can manufacture, but of greater importance still, it provides him with the financial power sufficient to meet any emergency that may arrive. Arise. The fact that uh, he has already demonstrated on at least one occasion. Right. As a result of his understanding of the value of the cooperative principle, Ford has removed himself from the usual position of dependence upon financial institutions and at the same time provided himself with more commercial power than he could possibly use. Federal Reserve Bank system is another example of cooperative effort which practically ensures the United States against a money panic. Well, if you've read about the Federal Reserve, you know that that's not always true. Sometimes the Federal Reserve has not done what it's supposed to do. Why? Who knows? Maybe it's political. Maybe it's just human error, difference of opinion. Not everybody who uh, goes into finance or law or whatever is of the same opinion or mind, right? the, like the federal, speaking of federal, right? Federal courts, right? The U.S. Supreme Court. You get nine people on there, right, of different backgrounds, and it's not always, or the decisions are not always the same. There's a variation, right? Sometimes they're more conservative with the traditional um a tr more traditional look at con constitutional law. Sometimes it's more centrist. Sometimes it's more progressive. And there's multiple interpretations, like nine different interpretations of the Constitution. Are you going with classic interpretation? Are you going by the word of the inter interpretation? 
the the time uh you know the time of the interpretation going by how things are now as opposed to uh, the original meaning original interpretation of the constitution so there's all these different variations out there and that's why things are difficult to to pin down and achieve and get accomplished right there's quite a variance or variation and if you think that in any system of considerable or you know considerable mildly so or considerable complexity that one can come up with absolute solutions you know that's why the majority of people experts experts look this stuff up you know do some reading research the more majority of experts over time have been wrong Right. Majority of economic experts, the more majority of experts in the sciences, the majority of experts in regards to climate, the majority of experts in regard to ed education. Most of the time they're they're wrong. You know, welcome to being humans. What a surprise. The chain store systems constitute another form of commercial cooperation that provides advantage through both the purchasing distribution into the business. The modern department store, which is the equivalent of a group of small stores operating under one roof, one management, and one overhead expense is another illustration of the advantage of cooperation effort in the commercial field. Less than 15, you will observe the possibility of cooperative effort in its highest form. At the same time, you will see the important part that it plays in the development of power as you have already learned power is organized effort. True. Three most important factors that enter into the process of organization, organizing effort are concentration. See? So here's a little bit of the connecting or merging of lessons or principles, right? Concentration, cooperation, coordination. And then there's this how power is developed through cooperation. Interesting. In the uh, third full paragraph there, one fourth full paragraph, take as an example any business or profession that you choose and you will observe by analysis that it is limited only by the lack of application or organized cooperative effort. As an illustration, consider the legal profession. If a law firm consists of but one type of mind, it will be greatly handicapped. There you go, right? Even though it may be this so law, law profession, right? I'm just, just, just talked about the Supreme Court, right? That's why you don't want just one individual, you know, that's a monopoly, that's fascism, right? That's dictatorship, right? That's kind of the ar archaic ways of the agrarian world. The agrarian world was pre-America uh, when most uh, leaders were, you know, kings and queens who were complete dictators, monarchs, you know. Uh, and if you watch that movie, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Mel Gibson, Braveheart, uh, we're, we're going back to what is that, the 14th, 15th century, something like that, I forget exactly. But it's about the contention between Britain, um, uh, Ireland, and Scotland, right? And, and uh, William Wallace is a Scotsman, right? And there's uh, the the British king is just a complete absolute fascist pig can i say that right um he he even uses divide and conquer concept from sun Tzu, the art of war he uses the concept all you military people will know this right he even uses the concept of divide and conquer why should i just send my soldiers in there and lose all my soldiers not that he cared he used to send i remember there was one scene where he's his, he says let the archers shoot but sir, some of our soldiers or foot soldiers are down there. Yeah, we got plenty, right? So he doesn't really care about the lives, the individual lives, as long as the overall, the, in the aggregate, he's getting what he wants, which is victory, you know, victory in battle and in war, right? So anyways, he opposes, tricks the Scots and the Irish to oppose each other. Then they meet out in the battlefield and they're like, what are you doing out here? What are you doing out here? You know, we, we heard this and that about you. Yeah, we heard this and that about you. Why those damn Brits, that stinking low-life king, you know, right? So that's cooperation. There's cooperation right there, right? All right, where was it? Let's talk about power. Cooperation and power. There you go. Uh, 
The development of personal power is but the first step to be taken in the development of the potential power that is available through the medium of allied effort cooperation, which may be called group power. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip down. Anyways, yeah, I was in the uh, fourth full paragraph. Take as an example any business or profession that you choose, and you will observe by analysis that it is limited only by the lack of application of organized and cooperative effort. As an illustration, consider the legal profession. True. We just talked about that. But I just gave you an example, right? Um, law partnership. A good stock of self confidence and a new suit of clothes, excuse me, will help you land and maybe losing a few pounds and getting into shape and getting a positive pause positive frame of mind by going out and doing some good things for people. We'll help you land a position without pull. But remember that nothing will go so far toward helping you hold it as will push enthusiasm, determination to do more than that for which you are paid. And I say, I think my philosophy is don't do 100%, don't do 500, 1,000, go ballistic, go crazy, go nuts. That's what I started doing. I don't know how many uh, professors start reading books uh, half a dozen to maybe a dozen books in multiple fields, 10, 12, 15 different fields over a period of 10, 12 years, you know, reading books in science and history and mathematics and theology and law and uh, po political science and the money, money systems, finance, whatever else, right? Because I, I said, you know, if I'm going to help humans, humankind, then what is all what is all this stuff out there? You know, all these different different disciplines. What are these disciplines really uh, looking at? What is what is their objective? What are they doing? What's their what's their push and their pull? What's their impetus? Right. And I really started to see what humans are about, and what our education system is about, and what our monetary system is about and what our economy is about, and where money comes from, and what is wealth, and what is motivating us economically, right? What is motivating us politically? I see it all, I see it all, I see it all. I don't see it all, I see a lot. I've seen a lot, and I see it pretty clearly. And it's pretty stimulating, it's pretty uh, thought-provoking, it's pretty enlivening, and it's also critical to not only for me to know, but to pass this on to have people pass it on to others so that we can all empower each other and maximize all, all of us in a community in the largest sense that so we can better each other, you know, better ourselves. Enough with this division, right? Right? You know, that's been going on. Look at the, the British king, right? William Wallace, uh, Braveheart. Going back, that's, you know, 14th, 15th century, right? But this has been going on since the dawn of time, since humans have been meeting each other and organizing each other, meeting in groups or, po or opposing groups, right? It's nothing new, right? Uh, divide and conquer. It's done in the political, it's done in the physical sphere, it's done in the economic sphere and elsewhere, right? It's a great, not moral or ethical, but it's a great technique that really works, even though it's uh, deceptive, right? And malicious, that type of thing, divide and conquer. Well, sometimes maybe you're on the good end. You know, the, you're the good guys and gals, and you're looking to protect something of great merit and integrity. And you have to defeat an evil opposition, World War One, World War Two, right? And uh, you use those techniques, deception, to win, to beat the evil, to beat down the evil, right? Anyways. Many a business fails because all of the men back of it are salesmen or financial men or buyers. By nature, the most able salesmen are, and again, sorry for the men, all the men stuff, but this is back in a time when it was. Um, anyways, nature of the most able salesmen are optimistic, enthusiastic, emotional. Well, able financial men, as a rule, are unemotional, deliberate, and conservative. How about that one? Both classes are essential to the success of commercial enterprise, but either class will prove too much of a load for any business without the modifying influence of the other class, right? So it's always about diversity, um, modification, doing things or having things in small measures, in certain measures, maybe not small, but in some measure here, some measure there, right? 
Is it good to have all uh, ma upper management? No, you need some middle management, some lower management. You need some, um, you know, worker bees, queen bees, king bees, are there king bees? I don't know. Uh, what else we have? The United States of America is one of the richest and most powerful nations of the world. Definitely was. Well, 28, this is 1928. So this this is actually um this is just right before, right around the time, time of the Great Depression, right? Um and World World War World War I uh was 1914s. So World War II was coming, right, in the 30s, 38, 39, right? With Hitler taking the right right land, right land, and then Poland, you know, and so forth. Right? Upon analysis, it will be seen that this enormous power has grown out of cooperative efforts of the states of the Union. It was for this purpose of saving this power that the immortal Lincoln made up his mind to erase the Mason-Dixon line, right? So that's one of the key major critical aspects, elements of Lincoln's desire to keep all the states together, right? Because he knew if the states became divided and if the states became separate countries, there was much more greater opportunity, opportunity for division and war and more problems, not fewer problems. Just like now, people say, you know what? You know, Texas should uh, secede from the Union, California, New York, Florida, and create their own countries. Or maybe you get all the Democrat states with the, with the get all the Democrat people to move into one area of the United States. And all the Republican Republicans to move into another area of the United States you can't do that. So maybe you do it by greater population, you know. So California becomes uh, 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 its own country. Texas, these, these states are pretty big. They're actually bigger than a lot of countries. You know, Texas becomes its own country. Florida, New York, I don't know how it would work. But then that, that creates all kinds of problems because once once you create countries. Those are greater borders than states that are united, and there's going to be differentiation. And whenever there's differentiation in borders or a greater emphasis and division of borders, via borders, then there comes war, right? Or greater potential for war. And also there's new laws and ways of trading and having to deal with uh, laws, um, ownership. Um, if I live in a particular state and all my or many of my family live in another state um, and I own some property in that other state my family through my family and that state breaks off and becomes a whole new country now the laws change so you know that type of division or separation or seceding of states to, to countries or more divided uh, units right of population just this just exacerbates things it makes things much more complicated much more risky and, and tenuous tenuous kind of like oh crazy things stuff could happen at any moment what whoa, whoa whoa not united states different countries right uh oh right so anyways uh saving the power lincoln made his mind to erase the mason dixon line the saving of the union was far greater concern to him than the freedom of the slaves of the South, which is true, right? True. And he did free the slaves and he didn't like slavery, but he also thought it would be the best thing or something that would, would be critical in winning the war. Because you you free, free the slaves um, and all of a sudden these free slaves are going to want to do what? fight for the side that freed them, right? So even if they stay in the South, now they're going to be contentious against the South or to the Southerners, right? That would be crazy. That would be terrible for the South, and it was, right? So it was, it was kind of 13th Amendment. You know, look, look this stuff up, right? 13th, 14th Amendment. Oh, boy, you guys need to read the Constitution. I haven't memorized the actual abolition of slavery, right? Oh, that's not it. 
either slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly, duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, right? So uh, that was done away with, right? Um, December, I was looking at the date, ratified, meaning brought into law, December 6, 1865, right? That's during the uh, Civil War. So he did that for a reason, you know. He didn't like slavery, you know. He was opposed to it, saw it a, a sin against humankind. But it wasn't just about being a nice guy. Let's free the slaves. No, he understood that he, he wanted to keep the country together. And one of the things, first of all, one of the things he had to do was get rid of that heinous sin, slavery. But at the same time, it freed up, I don't know, a lot of, a lot of men, women, right? People. And they're they're going to be on the side of whoever freed them up, North. That's why so many ran to the North, right? So for the South, that was a terrible thing. And it actually really helped to um, move the war effort forward for the north and to to win the civil war right had this not been so the present status of the united states as a power among the nations of the world would be far different from what it is it would be far weaker disorganized not as wonderful a place to come for potential people like my wife from colombia or like my mother and her family from portugal or my father from france and ireland the potato famine my um, grandmother from Portugal, she was asked one time, do you want to go back to, do you ever want to go back to Portugal? No, no, not that poor place, right? And when my wife went to Colombia, um, and um, the first time she went back, went by, back by herself, or, or might have taken my son with her, but she said, you know, she goes, this, I don't like it here. <laughs> She'd been spoiled. She'd become Americanized, right? She goes, this, this place is, so poor, it's terrible, you know. Um, I want to come home. She, we, we had just gotten her green card, citizenship, right? So, anyways. um, it was the same principle of cooperative effort that Woodrow Wilson had in mind when he created his plan for the League of Nations. He first, first saw the need of such a plan as a meeting for, for preventing war between nations, just as Lincoln saw it as a meeting for harmonizing the efforts of the people of the United States, thereby preserving the Union, right? So it's very critical. Seceding from the union may sound good, right? But if you really understand what that means in the most minute of details, it is a terrible idea. It was a terrible idea then. It's a terrible idea now and always will be, right? <clears throat> Thus it has been seen that the principle of organized cooperative effort through the aid of which the individual may develop personal power is the self-same principle that must be employed in developing group power, right? But I think you're getting this. Let's look at the break here at the bottom. Again, I don't want to go on too long. I know these, I could turn these sessions into mul multiple hours. Anyway, so at the bottom of there at the break, off the coast of Norway is the most famous and irresistible maelstrom in the world. Do you know what a maelstrom is? Look it up if you don't know words. This great whirlpool of ceaseless motion has never been known to give, give up any victim who was caught in its... Uh-oh, what's going on? My light is fading. Weird. Power surge, maybe. Um, a pity victim caught in the circling embrace of falling water. No less sure of the destruction of those unfortunate souls who were caught in the great maelstrom of life. There you go. Nice transition. Toward which all have, uh, which all who do not understand the principle of organized cooperative effort are traveling. There you go. All right. Good point. Solid point. Big point. Major point. We are living in a world in which the law of survival of the fittest is everywhere in evidence. Those who are fit are those who have power, and the power is organized efforts, right? And there is power, and there's power in knowledge, but there's power in knowledge of merit, of import, 
of impact, just studying, um, just acquiring and gathering uh, miscellaneous knowledge uh, without applying um, reason to it, reason of merit, or, you know, something that you're you're acquiring that knowledge to do something, not just to to know things for the sake of knowing. Trivial pursuit, right? You should do it for merit, merit pursuit, the pursuit of merit, right? Something of value. Unfortunate is the person who either through ignorance or because of egotism imagines that he or she can sail this sea of life from the frail bark of independence. Nice, nice. Such a person will discover that there are maelstroms more dangerous than any mere whirlpool or unfriendly waters. All natural laws and all the nature's plans are based upon harmonious cooperative effort as all who have attained high places. There's in mathematics, I remember reading my math books. It's it's um, the golden rule, I think it is, the golden rule. Or, you know, there's this um, geometric form. It's, it's kind of a swirling geometric form. And it's the, the golden rule, the perfect shape, the perfect shape according to the mathematical equation of it, right? And it appears in many things throughout the world naturally, right? It appears in flora and fauna and science, I don't know, wherever, you know? Um, so there's something to this um, organization. Cooperation is organization, right? Uh, wherever people are engaged in unfriendly combat, no matter what may be its nature or its cause, one may observe the nearness of one of these maelstroms that await the combatants. Success in life can be attained except, cannot, sorry, be attained except through peaceful, harmonious, cooperative effort. That's why I find, you know, me personally, if I'm finding something that's grinding, grinding, you got to stop it. Fix it, maybe, if you need to continue in that direction. Fix it. But if it's grinding, 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 what are you doing? And by grinding, 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 I'm talking about maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a class you're taking. Maybe it's a degree you're going for. There's a lot of grinding in education. For what end do you know? Do you have a plan? Is there an application? Is there a method to the madness? What are you doing? What are you doing it for? What have you planned out? What's the purpose, right? This is what you need to know. Nor can success be attained single-handedly, handed or independently, even though a person lives as a hermit uh, in the wilderness, far from all signs of civilization, that person is nevertheless dependent upon forces outside of themselves for an existence. The more he or she becomes a part of the civilization, the more dependent upon cooperative effort that person becomes, right? A lot of good stuff. I'm only on page 21. I know I got to start skipping. Fortunes that are acquired through a cooperative effort include no scars upon the hearts of their owners, which is more than can be said of the fortunes that are acquired through conflict competitive methods that borders on extortion, accumulation of material wealth, whether the object is that of a bare existence or luxury, consumes most of the time that we put into this earthly struggle. True. If we cannot change this material, material, materialistic tendency of human nature, we can at least change the method of pursuing it by adopting cooperation as the basis of uh, pursuit. So this is kind of the easing, the easing of the challenge, I guess, cooperation, where um, you know you find other people to do things. Not you're not going to do everything. You don't know everything. You Ford, Henry Ford, Ford, Ford cars. He says, "I'm no genius. I'm not the best at much. But what I can do is really find people who are good at the things that I need to find people good at." Right? Cooperation. How do you build large companies? How do you build an entire country, education system, um, whatever, right? A movie. You ever see at the end in the credits at the end of a movie? It's got to be like thousands of people. How the hell do they organize all that, right? It's amazing. So cooperation is huge in almost accomplishing anything. And in smaller measures too, you know, cooperation within the family, cooperation within a class or with your teacher. You know, it could be just two people or a handful of people, but sometimes it's, you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands, right? Millions. 
cooperation of 300 million Americans. We must pull together. This, I always like these quotes, quibbling over salary to start with has lost many a person the big opportunity of a lifetime. If the position you seek is one that you know, you can throw your whole heart into, there you go, right? Take it. Even if you have to work for nothing until you, del you deliver a good sample of your goods. Therefore, you will see pay in proportion to the quality and quantity of the work you perform. There you go, right? That's why this concept of minimum wage, you know, just jack it up, uh, $15, 30 60 100 whatever it is, uh, is ridiculous, minimum wage, right? Um, if you start paying people too much for a minimum wage, then you're paying people coming in off the street with no knowledge, no skills, no work habits in place, right? So you have to give, say it's 60 bucks an hour. So no, no matter who walks in off the street for any job, you know, you have to pick up garbage and put it in the garbage bin in the back. Minimum wage, 60 bucks an hour. Yeah. And then what about the person that was making 60 bucks an hour, but they had to work their tails off for years and acquire some skills and knowledge and experience and education, maybe, right? What about them now? They're, they're not going to want 60. They're going to want like 70, 80, 90. So they're just off the street, get them 60. Look how much I put in five years, all this work and training. Blah, give me 80. Right. So you're creating a whole quibbling, speaking of quibbling over salary. A lot of people don't understand how things work. It's all knee jerk. You know, I want more money. I'm a minimum wage person. Just give me more money. And you don't think about the uh, repercussions of increasing minimum wage, how it's going to affect anyone other than you and your immediate desires. That is a very selfish and um, narrow uh, scope, narrow look at the problem, right? Not a very long-term, intelligent, useful uh, application of understanding, not of merit. Um, one of the advantages of business college training is that it prepares you for action, not to be little other methods of education, but exalt the modern business college method. I am reminded to say that there are some colleges in which the majority of the students are preparing for practically everything else except action. That's a good point. True then, true now, right? What What are you taking in college? What do you do? Why are you trusting some arbitrary understanding of notions of what a curriculum is for X, Y, or Z job, right? You trust, you just blindly trust these people? How about you take control of your life? Ensure that things will be running more smoothly and productively for the long term, for you, betterment in the long, short term, long term, right? Maybe do some research. I want to become fill in the blank, whatever it is, accountant, doctor, lawyer, engineer, blah, 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 blah. You know, exactly where do I want to work? Do I want to be an accountant at Disney? Do I want to be an accountant at uh, Twitter? Do I want to be an accountant at the, the florist shop? Right? So you can be accountants at large, small, medium, all different types of environments, all different types of people. Right? Um, and what exactly do you need? And is what you're getting or have gotten so far, and including what you're getting now, going to prepare you for whatever it is that you're going for, right? And you don't want just a job or just a career. You want something as specific as possible. I want a job as an accountant at Disney, uh, you know, working in with um, people, uh, highly creative people, you know, Disney uh, artists and creators and so forth and such, because uh, that's what I grew up with. And I want to be in that environment. Or I remember seeing, what was it? Um, Apple. I think it was Apple. Pretty sure. Uh, and you, you look, you looked at the uh, the environment. It was very open. It was pr very progressive. It was very laid back. It was hardworking. People kind of dressed however they wanted to dress. They were sitting in bean chairs down in the main lobby at times. Hey, I'll meet you in the bean chair. Go over this stuff, you know. Or in the cafe downstairs or outside, you know, and then after we're done, maybe we'll play some basketball or some foosball in the back. You know, we're going to be staying late, so let's get something to eat at, at the restaurant downstairs. 
then meet you at the bean chairs. And then we'll, maybe we'll take a break and play some hoops or play with some electric cars, maybe ride bikes around the halls of the business establishment. You know, there, there's so many options. Yet people are very unimaginative, uncreative, unknowing, uncaring. Lazy, I don't know what it is. Figure it out. Don't be that. Right? Oh, what do we got? I'm going to skip. We've got some. Um... Oh, this is a good one. Luckily, most college graduates do not build upon such flimsy foundations because no college on earth can crown, crown with success the person who tries to collect for that which he knows instead of that which he can do with what he knows. The man to whom I have referred from one of the best known families is Virginia. Virginia. Uh, I'm not going to get into these examples. Um, you can read through that. Here's a good joke to play on your employer. Get to your work a little earlier and leave a little later than you are supposed to. Handle his tools as if they belong to you. Go out of your way to say a kind word about him to your fellow workers. When there's extra work that needs to be done, volunteer to do it. Do not show surprise when he gets on to you and offers you the head of the department or partnership in the business. But this is the best part of the joke, right? I've done that before. Be the first one there. Eat through the breaks and lunch or you know, work, work through lunch. Stay late. Work through the weekends. You know, and don't, don't, you, you don't want to do that your whole life. And especially you don't want to do that. Too much when you got a family, you know, because a dear old dad or mom, like, where are they? Let's see. The mass psychology of the city is new. Talking about Boston, you said Harvard here. I don't know what that is. Anyways, more examples. There are people, says men, Second full paragraph, who dream but do nothing more. There are others who take the vision of their dreams, dreamers, and translate them into stone, marble, music, and good books, railroads, steamships. What have I done? Um, I moved out of my home state when I was 28, 29, 30, maybe. Moved from Connecticut to Boston, started doing stand-up comedy, um, came out here, did the same. Found out it's not where I wanted to be, so I got my degrees, undergrad and advanced degrees, started teaching, and my thing was really about writing, so I started writing. I've written three, four, five hundred articles. I've written dozens of poems. I've written nine, ten books, uh, so far at least. Um, organized the business, the coaching platform, and so forth and so on, you know. You know, I've pretty much done what I was supposed to do. It hasn't worked out how I planned, but I, I give, you know, I gave the stand up a good number of years, six, seven years, you know, I gave the teaching a good number of years, six, seven years before I moved in upon, encroached upon the next uh, part of the, the mission or the plan, right? My, my mission, my plan, uh, and so forth, right? I like this statement about laziness. Laziness is nothing but the influence of an inactive mind on the cells of the body, right? If you doubt this, next time you feel lazy, take a Turkish bath and have yourself well rubbed down, thereby stimulating the cells of your body by artificial means, and see how quickly your laziness disappears. Huh, interesting. I think that's why we have to move around, move around every day, right? Uh, you sit around too much. You know, I feel that now. We're, we're, having, we're experiencing really hot weather, and... I have like breathing issues, so I really can't go outside much. Um, I have, but I'm gonna come back. Oh, I can't breathe. Um, so you know, you know, the whole family, all of us, many people in the area are not going out much. But uh, and you do, you do, you do get kind of a little bit of lazy if you're not moving. That's why you need moving. But usually, you know, I'm walking, I'm working out, I'm hanging out, doing stuff. Right? Uh. Cells of the body respond to the state of the mind. So this is kind of the physiological aspect or element of success. Mind over body, body of mind, or mind with the body, cooperation. In exactly the same manner that the people of the city respond to the mass psychology that dominates the city. True. If a group of leaders engage in sufficient action to give a city the reputation of being a live wire, the city action influences all live there. The same principle applies to the relationship between the mind and the body, an active dynamic 
mind keeps the cells of which the physical portion of the body consists in a consistent state of activity. I remember hearing once I was listening to a baseball game and the announcer, non-athlete, was talking to a baseball, a former baseball player. And he says, uh, you know, if the hitters are doing well or the pitchers are doing well, do the hitters influence the pitchers or vice versa? He goes, oh, yeah, very much so. Right. So there's something about the, um, you know, the relationship, the energy, I guess you could say, the energy relationships between people, right? Here it is for use if you want it. Middle paragraph, you cannot be a person of action if you run to the pill bottle every time you have or imagine you have an ache or pain or swallow an aspirin tablet every time you your intestines call in your brain for a douchebag of water. <laughs> and spoons, I don't know what that is. Spoon some old ancient methodology and a spoonful of salt for cleansing purposes. Oh, maybe an enema. You cannot be a person of action if you over eat or under exercise. There you go. That's what I was talking about. Right? Okay. If I think it, it will come. Um, the worry, another enemy, worry habit, right? The second to last paragraph. Second lesson of this course, you learned that your definite chief aim in life should be supported by a burning desire for realization. You can have no burning desire for achievement when you are in a negative state of mind, no matter what the cause of the state of mind may be. Right? Staying a positive, I have discovered a very effective gloom chaser. It may not be a very dignified way of expressing my meaning, but since the subject lesson is actually not dignity, I will make it certain. The gloom chaser to which I refer to is a hearty laugh. True. When I feel out of sorts and inclined to argue with somebody over or something, that is not worthy of discussion. I know that I need to, my gloom chaser, proceed to get, that's, you know, that's me, Mr. Comedy Guy, using humor in the classroom or wherever. Right? It's, it's, it comes in handy. Just having a light sense of being. It's not good always being serious. You're going to, you know, you start hunching the shoulders, your back starts to, in, you know, move inward and so forth. The whole thing is not good. So stay, and I'm not always laughing or have a positive frame of mind. Sometimes I get down. Who doesn't? Right. But in the general, you want to do that. What else we got? I think we're uh, oh to be active, how not to procrastinate. We've talked about that before. But anyways, a lot more of the the detail of all this stuff. Um, I will get into with my my book all right again i'm going over this just as an exposure uh, to these principles and concepts and um, general overview discussion also whatever comes up impromptu that i find related to uh, these issues for the discussion so we got four more to go right so that's it we'll see you next time